Uh, I'm going to try and give you a bit of an idea of what's in the book, uh, the main kind of uh, takeaway points, and uh, hopefully you'll have a few questions, and I'm sure you'll probably disagree with some of the things and some of the claims I make about what's in the book and my understanding of where we're at and uh, some of the kind of collective issues that we face. And, and Kanishi is right. I am fairly pessimistic about... Uh, some of the things that are happening in the world today and the fact that, for example, uh, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are two of the most powerful men in the world. I mean, it's a pretty profound indictment of the democratic process in many ways. Uh, and it's not surprising that a lot of young people, uh, and I know some of them in a strictly non-esque way, I know lots of young people, and uh, I'm not sure if we're allowed to say, oh, we're recording this, aren't we, unfortunately? Oh, dear. Edit that out, Ash, whenever you get to it. But, uh, but I do, I, one of the great joys of being an academic is you get to hang around with young people and find out what they think. And a lot of them are not optimistic or enthusiastic about the prospects for global governance and much else. And a lot of them have lost confidence in the democratic process, which is not a good thing for all of us, it seems to me. But uh, anyway, I'll get to that. So what I thought I'd do is... Uh, find the controls, first of all. Uh, give you a couple of definitions, just to start off with. And for those of you who are fortunate enough not to spend your lives in academic departments studying politics, uh, this is a kind of way of breaking up government versus governance. And one point to make at the outset is that uh, government's what happens in Canberra. Uh, and a lot of you might be skeptical about the quality of government in this country. And let me just say, uh, to be as provocative as possible, that I've never voted for the Liberal Party in my entire life, and I don't expect to do so. But uh, that's not a party political point. My point is that by global standards today, uh, Australia is not badly run. Uh, and it could be a lot worse. And it is a lot worse in lots of other places around the world. There's plenty of failing democracies. Uh, there's plenty of authoritarian regimes that aren't terribly pleasant and do awful things for their citizens. So by world standards, uh, this is about as good as it gets. So uh, that's worth keeping in mind. The interesting thing uh, about governance, which is the uh, thing that I'm going to be talking about more uh, this evening, is that it's, uh, it's more complex, it involves more actors, and it involves actors other than the state. Now, I think that the state is still incredibly important and it's the most powerful actor that there still is in the international political system. My colleague, the esteemed Professor Jai Zaria, might disagree with how significant uh, the state still is, and plenty of people do. I think it's still very important, or at least some states are very important, because clearly there's a bit of a difference between China and Fiji and the United States and Australia, for that matter. Some states are much more consequential and capable of exerting an influence on international affairs than others, and some of them are just kind of there to make up the numbers. But states still matter, or at least some of them do. Uh, but there are a whole range of other actors that are at least trying to have an impact on international affairs and exert some influence over the way that the world works uh, and the kind of decisions that are made over issues that affect all of us, uh, whether we voted for these people, uh, whether we like them, uh, whether they come from authoritarian regimes or whatever. So lots of new actors are trying to have an influence, non-governmental actors, non-state actors. Uh, some of them are having an influence at the margins, perhaps, uh, but states are still uh, pretty uh, important. And as I'll explain as I go along, that tension between uh, national interests, state goals, and uh, wider collective interests that actually transcend national borders is, I think, one of the kind of defining issues of the times that we uh, live in. So that's something I'm going to be talking about a bit. Okay. Uh, you probably recognize this place. Uh, the point of putting this, it's quite uh, a good time to have this particular photo on because as we, all, we have all been celebrating or remembering a uh, man, and it was chaps, walking on the moon uh, a little while ago. And I have to say, when these photos started to appear, uh, I'm of a certain generation, uh, I think they're called hippies in my day, but I'm a bit, still a bit of an aging hippie now. And when these photos started appearing uh, of a sort of, uh, cosmic view of the planet, 
I had a pretty big effect on me uh, and quite a few other people of my generation. And I think for the first time, there was a sense that uh, globalization actually meant something uh, in a quite tangible and immediate kind of way that it had never done before because we'd never seen ourselves as kind of floating around on this little ball in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and our collective fate was indeed a collective fate in a way that it had never been before. And I think that was potentially an uplifting and inspiring kind of idea. Hasn't been one that's been taken terribly seriously by some of the people who run the place at the moment, it has to be said, but it seemed to be uh, uh, a seminal moment in human history. I think it was. Uh, and I think we're still all trying to figure out quite what that meant and what the implications of that are for how we kind of run the place. And the, the place in this case is the globe as a whole, as it were. So, so globalization, there's a whole literature about this you won't be at all surprised to hear, and many learned books have been written about it. And uh, there's quite a bit of debate about what exactly it means, who it applies to, uh, and uh, how significant it is. But it's a useful shorthand, I think, for some of the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And the fact that uh, political processes, processes of governance, no longer happen uh, exclusively within uh, national borders in the way that they have done for the last four or five hundred years or, at least. And that's something else to keep in mind when you're thinking about these kind of processes, that the nation state is a relatively new phenomenon in human history. It's only been around for four or five hundred years. Uh, we didn't have them before that. And there's absolutely no reason to suppose we're going to have them forever. In fact, I'd be surprised uh, if they do uh, persist, or I'd be surprised if they persist in a world that's worth inhabiting. Uh, and I'm going to suggest to you, or it might become apparent in my remarks, that maybe uh, nation states that we've taken for granted as being central to process of international governance for the last four or five hundred years, maybe they're part of the problem rather than the solution, or they are... Uh, in the ways that they're run and the kinds of people who run them at the moment, at least. Maybe they could still be forces for uh, really important, effective political organization, but many of them aren't, and many of them are run by pretty unpleasant megalomaniacs of one sort or another, and not all of them are unelected megalomaniacs at that. And I can think of a couple off the top of my head who fit that bill. But anyway. That for better or worse, the nation state is still a very important part of the international system, uh, but there are different ideas about what states should do. And I won't bore you with uh, a lot of international relations theory, but if you're enthusiastic about such things, there's an entire chapter in the book that's dedicated to uh, going through uh, most of the big theories in international relations in exhaustive detail. So there's a page turner for you. Uh, at some stage. So, but anyway, there's a lot of debate about uh, the theoretical implications of what states might or might not do, but there's also a lot of debate amongst policymakers about what states might or might not do. And as I'll explain later on, the uh, pivotal states in this particular debate are the United States and America, and they have very different ideas about how states should be run, about who should run them, uh, about what the purpose is of uh, national political activity should be uh, and about what the consequences should be for the people who live within uh, various national borders. So that's an important part of the particular uh, historical moment that we're going through at the moment and the resolution of that competition and rivalry uh, between the two most powerful states in the world is going to be consequential uh, and some people uh, and there's a large and uh, influential literature, particularly in North America, some people think it's all going to end in tears. Some people think, so-called realists, uh, that there's an inevitability uh, about uh, the prospects for conflict between rising and declining powers, uh, and that a rising power like China will seek to displace the current hegemonic power of the era, and there's only one way that's going to happen, historically, and that's through force of arms. Now, that's not a fairly cheery uh, scenario, and it's not one that I subscribe to, but it's very influential. And lots of people in the United States, lots of people that hang around with Donald Trump, take that idea terribly seriously. John Bolton, for example, uh, is about as hardcore a realist as you would possibly, I don't say like to find, but I'm not sure you really would, but uh, he's a 
piece of work is one way of describing them, but he's a very influential one, uh, and that's slightly alarming, I think, for all of us. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll get onto that in a bit more detail in a moment. But, uh, but for policymakers, uh, the idea of giving up sovereignty, and if there's one thing Donald Trump's uh, good at, it's uh, coming up with a phrase that resonates with maybe not everybody in the United States, because there are lots of smart, educated, liberal, enlightened, progressive people in the United States. Uh, but you don't need to win over all those people. You only need to win over enough people. Uh, and it's a minority in the States, of course, because of gerrymandering and electoral rigging and all kinds of other things. You only need to win over a relatively small proportion of the population with that kind of uh, rhetoric, and you can get into power, as uh, Donald Trump has done. But Donald Trump, making America great again, uh, promoting the national interest, he's not somebody who's going to be enthusiastic about sharing power, about ceding uh, sovereignty, about pooling sovereignty with other countries, especially China, uh, or even Canada, uh, for that matter. So uh, that's the kind of, uh, one of the pivotal obstacles we face collectively to trying to engender some uh, basis for acting collectively to address some of the challenges that I'm going to describe that transcend national boundaries and simply can't be addressed effectively by any individual nation state acting on its own. That's the kind of bottom line, it seems to me. This is a little uh, table or chart or whatever we describe that as uh, that I plagiarized from a famous academic called James Rosnow, who is sadly no longer with us. Uh, but he was a very smart chap, and he came up with a famous phrase about uh, governance without government. And that kind of captures something about uh, the nature of globalization and the, the style of politics that's come to be a feature of the contemporary international order, certainly since the period since the Second World War, but intensively over the last uh, 20 or 30 years or so. The big point to make about this is that there are these other actors now involved in the process of governance uh, above the state at the kind of transnational level, alongside the state, uh, where you have national corporations and uh, other actors, and below the state, uh, the West Australian government is an example of a kind of sub-national actor that wields a bit of influence uh, and is part of this kind of gov governance process. The point to make is that nation states, uh, even in the best run nation states, which we have one of them, believe it or not, uh, they are subject to a whole series of kind of cross-cutting pressures and tensions and uh, people wanting to influence the policy-making process, and it gets pretty difficult, particularly when some of those, those pressures are coming from the transnational level because our policymakers are immobile by the kind of standards of today because transnational corporations, if they don't like the regulatory regime that you're offering in your particular neck of the woods, they can go somewhere else. They can put, sometimes they've got sunk costs and it's a bit difficult and if you're manufacturing things, but there's plenty of industries that can kind of pick up and go somewhere else uh, where there are maybe no taxes or there's no uh, trade unions or whatever it else it might be that they think they need to do their businesses more effectively. So there are kind of plenty of pressures and there's pressures from NGOs, people like Greenpeace and others are uh, increasingly influential in trying to get particular sorts of agen uh, items on the agenda that states might not want to particularly think about, but I think it's a good thing uh, that they do. And uh, particularly in the areas of things like climate change where states are reluctant often to take uh, the attitudes and wishes of members of civil society at the national level and increasingly at the transnational level uh, as seriously as we might hope that they would want to. It's important to recognize that there's a big difference between what some people describe as the so-called Anglo-American states, the kind of uh, governments you find in Canberra, uh, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Britain, uh, and the kind of governments that you find in this part of the world outside of Australia, places like uh, China, places like Japan. There's a tradition in East Asia of the so-called developmental state, where the state plays a very central, powerful role in the initial development process. But as we see in China's case, 
it doesn't kind of give up running the place. Uh, and China has a very different uh, economic system, and it has a very different political system uh, than we do in a place like Australia. And that's at one level for us people, political scientists study, studying comparative political economy and comparative politics. That's really interesting. Uh, but it's really important uh, in terms of the competition for the, the best uh, or the most uh, efficient form of uh, government that might exist at the national level and by extension and by example uh, at the transnational level as well. Uh, and one of the things that the United States in particular did uh, very effectively was to uh, promote a view of what's described as uh, neoliberal governance, small government, uh, smaller role for the state, uh, less intrusive role for the state. They were very effective at promoting that kind of uh, model or imposing that kind of model uh, on would-be developing states throughout what used to be called the third world, but is now more fashionably described as uh, the South. But the point to make is that there's uh, a division and a debate about the best ways of organizing uh, economic policy uh, and much else. And this final point on this slide uh, is about the European Union, and I should put my cards on the table and say that there is no bigger admirer, I don't think, uh, of the Euro European Union than me. Uh, and my poor students, and apologies to those of you who have children or grandchildren who go to this university and have the dubious misfortune of being lectured by me, but I always say to them, if you can find a better argument, better evidence, go ahead, make an argument on that basis. Uh, it seems to me there's a pretty good argument to be made that the European Union is the best example of institutionalized transnational cooperation that the human race has yet developed. Uh, if it falls over, which I fear it may do, uh, it will be a tragedy, not just for the Europeans, but for our very idea of the poss possibility of transnational uh, cooperation of an enduring, useful, uh, and effective sort. And whatever you think about the European Union, yes, there are a lot of Brussels, bureaucrats in Brussels, and some of them aren't very effective, and it's difficult to get uh, effective representation and there's a legitimacy crisis and all the rest of it. The big point to make about the European Union is since it's existed, there hasn't been a war in uh, Europe between members of the European Union. And this is the most violent, blood-soaked part of the planet, bar none. Uh, they in introduced industrialized genocide and religious wars on an epic scale that would put ISIS and all the rest of them to shame. And yet, for the past 50 years or so, peace has prevailed. So if the European Union didn't do anything else in human history, that's not a bad result, it seems to me. So I'm still a big fan, uh, and the emergence of Brexit and some of the other things that are going on at the moment is, I think, a tragedy of historical proportions. Not everybody agrees, uh, but uh, there you go. I'm happy to uh, debate that. We've lost one person of the audience, sadly, so possibly a closet Brexit here. Uh, yes, quite okay. you, can't, you can't please everybody, but that's the nature of this business, isn't it? So, uh, okay, so let me say something about China and the United States. Uh, and the big point about this, I think, is that uh, in the academic literature, there's a kind of uh, debate about hegemony or hegemony, we don't even know how to pronounce it, but there's a debate about it, however you want to pronounce it, and the point, uh, the, the big point to make about hegemony, I think, is that for everybody in this room, nobody can remember anything else except the United States dominating the international system and some form of American hegemony or American ideas, American principles, American values, American ways of governing have been hugely influential. Now, they may not have converted every single part of the planet, and indeed they haven't, uh, but they've been very uh, powerful uh, in direct terms in military uh, and material forms, but they've also been important ideationally. Uh, and uh, for the immediate period after the Second World War, when America was revealed to be the most powerful uh, country on the planet, the Soviet Union offered uh, an alternative way of thinking about and organizing uh, political uh, 
uh, and economic life. And at the time, I think it's important to remember, it seemed a pretty credible uh, idea. And some, some of you are probably old enough to remember Khrushchev banging his shoes on the table at the United Nations and saying, we're going to bury you. And many people thought at that time that it was the Soviet Union that was going to win the Cold War and that capitalism was bankrupt, hopeless, and prone to crises. Now, some people still think that about capitalism, as it turns out, because not long ago we had another big crisis, which we seem to have every now and again uh, in capitalist economies because it kind of goes with uh, the territory. Uh, and that's important when thinking about uh, the rise of China because for many people around the world and particularly in China and let's not forget that there's whatever it is 1.3 billion people in China and that's a big chunk of the global population. For many people around the world uh, China offers a different uh, and highly successful model of economic development. And it's worth remembering that we've never seen uh, economic development on the speed or the scale uh, that we have in China in an unbelievably short space of time. When I first went to China in about 1990, everybody was riding around on bicycles and wearing blue uniforms. Uh, and uh, now it's just quite uh, unbelievable, the scale and rapidity of change that's occurred in that country. Now, whether it's quote-unquote socialist is another interesting kind of question, and you get told off suggesting that it's not when you're in China, uh, but it's different. I think it's a form of capitalism, but it's a form of state-dominated capitalism that represents something very different to the sort that's been promoted by the United States for the last 50 years, 50 or 60 years or so, and that's uh, important for thinking about how the world is going to be organized, what the big ideas are that are going to shape the world uh, over the next, uh, well, for the foreseeable future, my lifetime anyway. The interesting thing about China is that uh, people talk these days a lot about so-called geoeconomics. And this is using economic leverage that you derive from your uh, material uh, power and presence in the international economy to persuade people uh, to have a good opinion of you uh, and to do what, you, what they would like you to do, basically. And China's been very, very successful in doing this in our part of the world. Cambodia is the quintessential example of this, where the Cambodians will never say anything critical of China again for the foreseeable future, because China's basically bought them off with lots of trade, aid, and investment. So that's been pretty effective. But let's not forget that those of you uh, old enough or read about the Marshall Plan, it was exactly the same deal. Powerful hegemonic country uses its economic leverage to win friends and influence people uh, and consolidate its influence over a particular part of the world. So there's nothing new about this apart from the fact that it's being done by a non-Western power uh, that subscribes to a very different view of the world uh, to the one that we're generally comfortable with and familiar with uh, in the form of something like neoliberal neo capitalism of the sort that the Americans promote. So that's a big and important change, I think. Where are we? Okay, so parts of the chapter, so there's a, there's a chapter on the US, there's a chapter on China in the book, and there's chapters on uh, a few case studies uh, as well. One of them is the uh, global economy. Uh, and this feeds directly into this debate between China and the United States about the, the kind of economic model that people might or might not want to subscribe to in the future, uh, depending on who they are, where they are, and what kind of developmental challenges uh, they face at any particular time. Now, this is always going to be a big issue uh, at any time, uh, it seems to me, but it's a particularly big issue in the aftermath of the, the GFC is the global financial crisis that broke out in 2008. And the big thing about the, deep, the global financial crisis is, firstly, it wasn't global. It was a crisis that was confined almost exclusively to North America, the United States in particular, where it started, and Western Europe. China, uh, large parts of East Asia were virtually unaffected by uh, the global financial crisis because of partly because of China's prominence and continuing uh, power in this part of the world kept uh, East Asia and us, of course, uh, afloat uh, during that uh, period. 
for the, the legitimacy, the authority, the influence of the American uh, economic model uh, as a consequence was profoundly undermined and maybe not as undermined as it should have been in the long term because we're going uncomfortably back to business as usual at the moment with some of the same pathologies emerging uh, in the global financial economy as we saw uh, in the late 2002, whatever we call them, the twos, the, uh, the zeros, the noughties, whatever we call them, whatever the, you know what I'm talking about, first decade of the century. So, uh, so we're going back to seeing some of those same kinds of things uh, emerging that we did before. So as a consequence of this, as a consequence of the, the undermining of the legitimacy of the American model, uh, China's relative uh, status and indeed its soft power has uh, emerged and consolidated as a consequence. And the fact that we're even talking about China having so-called soft power in a way that was only uh, ever associated with the United States uh, and its cultural influence over the rest of the world and its normative influence over the rest of the world, that is pretty astounding, it seems to me, that a so-called uh, the People's Republic of China, a so-called communist power, is exerting a powerful ideational influence, at least over some parts of the world. And that's a pretty interesting phenomenon, it seems to me. So that's one thing that's going on. The other thing is about uh, lots of people, uh, I think, including in uh, the heartlands of the Anglo-American economies, if you like, in Britain, America, uh, here as well. A lot of people were disillusioned disappointed and uh, hoping that their respective governments would actually do something to regulate uh, some of the excesses of the financial sector and some of the failures of governance that allowed those kinds of processes to occur uh, 10 years or so ago. Uh, and there have been some pretty important uh, public inquiries in this country about what happened and why it is uh, that the banking sector, for example, was driven by rampant greed and self-interest rather than the interests of its uh, customers. So these are important questions, as is the failure of big multinational corporations like Google and many others to pay any tax at all in many cases, but certainly to pay their fair share. And part of the problem is the capacity of individual states to regulate, govern, uh, and determine the behavior of highly mobile uh, companies that can afford to pay the best, best tax lawyers and accountants in the world when individual states can barely scrape together uh, enough people to do our taxes, never mind the taxes of multinational corporations. There's, a, there's an asymmetry of power and influence uh, between individual nation states and some of the most powerful corporations uh, in the world. And my intention here is not to launch into a diatribe about this, believe it or not, but my intention here is to, is to highlight that there's something absolutely fundamental uh, about the nature of the capitalist system, and this is not meant to be a diatribe about capitalism either. Capitalism is very good at producing stuff, maybe too good at producing stuff, which is one of the great paradoxes of our time uh, as well. But the, whatever you think about capitalism, it's all about satisfying individual interests, the pursuit of personal happiness, the pursuit, pursuit of individual interests. And the big problem that we face today is you can't do that without stuffing up the planet. It's as simple as that. So there's a fundamental disjuncture between what works for us as individual human beings responding to incentive structures that we associate with a capitalist economy and our ability to live in a sustainable way that's in harmony, keeping with uh, the finite boundaries of the planet. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem, uh, to say the least, it seems to me. And this gets me to uh, my next slide, which is the most depressing one of the lot, and we'll try and whiz through it so you don't all rush off and slash your wrists immediately after the lecture. But this is uh, a problem like no other. Uh, we've never had to face uh, a problem like this in the history of the world, because that's one of the defining aspects of globalization that we are, for better or worse, all in this together. Uh, and there's no way that 
We can solve it on our own. Either the United States can solve it on their own. We have to act collectively, and that's why the structures of global governance, uh, such as they are, are so important a part of responding to this particular challenge. And that's why the EU is particularly important, because if they haven't done anything else, they have made some progress uh, towards bringing in collective approaches to responding to climate change and doing something about it and uh, trying to restructure the economy of uh, Western Europe. And it's not easy. Uh, I'm deeply skeptical and pessimistic about the chances of actually being able to do that. Uh, but at least they're trying to do something and they're heading in uh, at least partly the uh, right direction. So this is the big challenge. Can we gear up to having a response that's based on effective uh, collective action. And the evidence so far is not terribly encouraging, as to be said. And China, paradoxically, is both a uh, source of hope and a source of possible despair. On the one hand, uh, there are just a lot of people in China who want to live like us. They want to have rising living standards, middle class lifestyles, jump on planes and fly around the world and do all the stuff we take for granted and who can blame them? If they do, they'll stuff up the planet. It's as simple as that, in precisely the kind of way that we're doing on a per capita basis, because we in Australia are some of the worst offenders in the world. And it's pretty hard to change that. There's just no two ways about that. On the other hand, China is the biggest investor in renewable green energy in the world, uh, and it's using state power uh, and telling uh, Chinese-based industry, this is the new plan, this is what we're doing, get on with it. So at one level, that kind of alternative way of dealing with this particular challenge seems to work, to some extent at least, in a way that the democratic paradigm in the United States plainly doesn't, where Trump has stacked the Environmental Protection Agency with ex-coal lobbyists and apologists for uh, climate denial and blah, blah, blah. It's enough to make you despair, but that's the reality, that uh, the democracies are not looking to crash hot. And our own government, the last election, Labour daringly went to the election with a policy platform, with ambitious goals and uh, offering a real choice uh, between them and the Liberals, and the voters rejected it en masse because it's all too difficult, too hard, and we're worried about our franking credit. So the idea we're all going to get behind some big, difficult set of challenges uh, that involve real pain and sacrifice and reorganizing the global economy, don't hold your breath. That's my gloom-inducing uh, me me message from uh, the environmental thing. On the other hand, uh, I have written, you may be astounded and appalled to hear this, but I've written another book, a uh, shorter one you'll be pleased to hear, which I believe uh, John Fillmore, my esteemed colleague from Curtin, is threatening to have a little launch for in October. And if you're interested, uh, send me an email, I'll tell you all about it. But the, the message of this book is about the possibly fanciful idea that populism could be used for environmental progressive purposes. And case in point is Extinction Rebellion. When I finished writing that new book six months ago, I'd never heard of Extinction Rebellion. They didn't exist in any meaningful way. Now I've not only heard of them, but they've encouraged the British government to declare a climate change emergency. Now it's one, it's a big difference between having a rhetorical flourish and saying, oh yes, we're all co concerned about the climate and actually doing something about it. I appreciate that, but hope springs eternal. They weren't even talking about it before, so uh, at least they're making a start. So, so maybe uh, popular upswell of uh, public interest and political pressure could actually bring about some kind of meaningful change. So, fingers crossed. So, we'll see what happens. This is an even bigger challenge, but the, but the message here is uh, arguably surprisingly encouraging, because the reality is when I'm teaching students uh, Introduction to International Politics, first lecture, I put up a couple of slides, one is about the decline of interstate war. They are really, really unusual and rare. 
states don't go to war with each other anymore. They certainly are happy to go and bomb some failing state in the Middle East or something and try out all their weapon systems and blow up a few civilians. There's plenty of that going on. There's plenty of chaos and mayhem in the world, but it's usually happening within national borders, not between them. So interstate war is very rare. The other thing that's encouraging for first year students at least is that Living standards have taken off like a rocket in the last hundred years or so, and that's good in principle, apart from all the things that are going on in the previous slide, of course. But, uh, but anyway, security is you know, one of the kind of uh, cautious bright spots in the global firmament at the moment because interstate war is in decline, there's not as much of it around, and there are signs of sustained cooperation, and not just in the European Union. Uh, in our own part of the world, ASEAN, I think it's a bit overrated, and I won't bore you with my views about that, but there's an ASEAN security community, some people claim, and that's one of the reasons why the Southeast Asians uh, don't go to war with each other as well. So there are some encouraging signs, but there are also lots of hell holes, or dare one quote Mr. Trump, and shitholes, I believe, is the technical term we use these days to describe some unfortunate parts of the world aren't doing quite as well as the United States is, allegedly. So, but anyway, there's plenty of problems around the world. Uh, hopefully, uh, there's examples of international cooperation and institutions dedicated to trying to do something about, it, about them, of which things like the United Nations is... It's got lots of problems which we could spend all night identifying. The amazing thing about the United Nations is it exists at all and people think it's a good thing to belong to, uh, even if it's not as effective as we would like it to be. So that's something uh, to cling on to, uh, it seems to me. So maybe uh, the fact that there are some examples around, there are some institutions that could do some of the heavy lifting uh, in addressing some of these security problems with the right will and support from some of the most powerful countries in the world, i.e. the United States, uh, and maybe something could be done. Who knows? Okay. Last slide. You'll be delighted to hear. So this, I found this on the web, this little picture. There are a million of these about uh, global conspiracies, global this, that, and the other taken over the world, black helicopters circling the United Nations. Uh, I mean, there's just so much completely bonkers stuff on the web about uh, world government and the United Nations and any attempt to collaborate or cooperate across national borders is deeply depressing. However, it's worth saying that some of the smartest people in my field, and after tonight's performance, you might say that's setting the bar pretty low, but, uh, but there are some smart people working in international relations, and many of them argue that world government is the only long-term hope for a couple of reasons. One is nuclear weapons are so dreadful, powerful, and destructive these days that if we don't do something about controlling them, if we can't figure out a way of keeping them under control, stopping them uh, spreading, it's only a question of time until they fall into the quote-unquote wrong hands. Now, I'd argue they already are, but that's another story. Uh, but everybody's... Uh, I think should be uh, worried about mass proliferation of nuclear weapons and that's something that might require serious forms of transnational cooperation, whether you call it world government or not is another question, but something that has the capacity to deal with that sort of thing. The other one I've been banging on about quite a bit already is global climate change without some really serious way of thinking about not just the technicalities of climate change, about where you get your energy from, how you trap CO2 or stop emitting more of it than we are doing at the moment, but how you address fundamental qu questions of inequality uh, in the world because uh, people in the developing world can rightly say, well, you chop down all your forests, you used up all your cheap renewable, non-renewable energy uh, because it suited you to do so, why can't we do the same? It's a pretty good question. So unless we think about really seriously trying to do something about that kind of really difficult question as well, uh, we're not going to get terribly far, it seems to me. So maybe uh, there's an argument for saying that we need more international institutions and cooperations rather than uh, less. And the other point to make about this, which I talk about a bit more in this other book about uh, environmental populism, is that just taking part in uh, progressive movements that are designed to uh, 
uh, encourage useful change in a positive direction and actually do something about some of these uh, problems, especially for young people, I think is a useful uh, thing for them to be doing, if only because they'll feel better about themselves. And my advice to students always is uh, you should always be optimistic because your parents will like you, you'll have more friends, and it will make a scrap of difference to the outcome either way, so you might as well. So, uh, so I think that's the wisest thing I've ever said to any of my students personally. So, but if we're thinking about you know, what's going to happen, how are we going to organize things, another question to ask is, what's the alternative? What is the alternative to cooperation? If you want to know, read a bit of realist theory in chapter two of my book, uh, and you'll find out what these gloom mongers think. They, they all think we're heading to uh, an inevitable, unstoppable conflict between the two greatest powers in the world. So that's their map for the future. Uh, I don't think it's terribly inspiring, but uh, hopefully there are a few glimmers of hope uh, in what I've said at least. I'll leave it there. Well, thanks, Mark. I had hope and despair. And, um, Actually, the last person I heard talk about with that optimist line was uh, Dr. Jim Cairns, who used to say that as well. Who of you is still alive would be an ageing hippie as well. But um, I wonder, it's time for um, Q&A. So um, we have a microphone here, and we are podcasting this, so um, if you could wait for the microphone. Um, do I see any hands up? I mean, there were so many things covered, and right there in the middle, and then over there, please, and then Jim over there. Hi there, uh, Michael Keane, Curtin University. Mark, how do you uh, how do you reconcile or understand the, the Chinese idea of community of shared destiny, uh, which is a kind of return to traditional Confucian models of governance with China's membership of the UN and the WTO, because it wants to be part of the UN, but it's also promoting this idea of a community of shared destiny, the, the traditional idea of Tianxia, as you know. Yep. I talk, well, the, the China chapter talks about that. And it's really interesting that some of the more prominent scholars in China, who you'd know better in the original language than I would, but uh, some of them use that idea as a way of uh, drawing on a distinctive Chinese theory of international relations. And one thing to think about is, well, for us academics to think about, I guess, more than anybody else is, do we study um, uh, the dominant models of realist foreign policy thinking that emerge out of places like America uh, because we think they're right and provide an accurate explanation of the world or because they come out of American institutions, they domin or dominate all the big journals and the big uh, figures from international relations are all based in prominent American universities. So the question is, if China cont continues on this upward trajectory, will Chinese ideas about international relations come to dominate the discourses of international relations and by extension perhaps uh, the policy making agenda as well. Now I'm not going to live long enough to see that I don't think but it's an interesting kind of question as far as the practicalities of what's going on at the moment maybe those kind of ideas don't fit very well with the idea of a cooperative basis between nations uh, to addressing big problems uh, because I think uh, China, like the United States, thinks that it's an exceptional country because of its might, power, particular history. And I think that's a bit of a problem. Uh, it was a problem when America was doing it, I think. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that it's a problem now that China's uh, adopting that kind of attitude towards the rest of the international system because it's not good for countries like us, so-called middle powers without the capacity to... Uh, act in the same kind of way as these great powers can do whatever script they think they're following uh, at the particular time, which is why I hope and think uh, and would encourage our government to take a more independent line in certain foreign policy issues and try to get different kind of ideas on the international policy agenda because plainly some of the ones we're following at the moment aren't working too well. This. Do you think conflict will occur as a self-fulfilling prophecy of realist assumptions? Do I think conflict is inevitable? Yeah. 
Absolutely not. No, I don't think anything's inevitable in life, you know, apart from death and taxes. And some people think that death uh, might be avoidable in about 50 years or so. So, uh, so who knows? But no, I don't think anything's inevitable. But I think the big worry is when policymakers in uh, China and the United States uh, subscribe to a particular view of the world, the sort that John Bolton does, where he sees everything that happens in the world as a potential threat and uh, a challenge to American dominance and hegemony. If people think that, and if the people, their opposite numbers in Beijing think, well, the Americans think that we're a big threat to them, so maybe we should rush out and buy some new super-duper guns and bombs and aircraft carriers as well, just to be on the safe side, it makes perfect sense uh, if you subscribe to that kind of uh, realist, uh, view of the world. Uh, I don't think it's inevitable, but I think it's very likely if that's the dominant framework within which some of those powerful uh, security thinkers, strategic analysts, and policymakers in the world view the world. If that's what they think is going on, it's probably likely that it will. And human history suggests that's been uh, something that has happened, and the realists have a point uh, when they look at the historical record. I mean, it's our job to try and demonstrate that that isn't necessarily the, the end point of human history or, you know, it doesn't look good, I don't think. Jim Baxter, a member of the Institute. Um, listening to your overall view, I just wonder what you have to say about the United Nations because I think that was in, conceived as a kind of global... Uh, government body, and mm. I think most of us would probably think it's failed in many areas. So is it um, retrievable? Is that the, the best way to go forward, uh, a modified United Nations or something else? It's a good question. It's a, non, it's, a, it's a really difficult question to answer. I mean, I mentioned in the talk that the I think the remarkable thing about the United Nations is that it still exists at all. But it, it's, it's, in some ways, it encapsulates all of the problems uh, that we face within national uh, spheres of political organization as well, in that democracies are uh, not always welcome. Because if it was done on a per head basis or even a uh, population basis of the different member states, then clearly India, Brazil, these kind of countries should be on the Security Council, or maybe we shouldn't have a Security Council at all. I mean, we could spend the entire evening detailing the problems that confront the United Nations and the difficulties of uh, involved in trying to overcome them or do anything about them. And they are formidable, and it doesn't look good. But uh, given, you know, what would the world look without the United Nations? So we would have abandoned even the, the hope and the symbolism of the possibility of cooperation, which would in some ways be just as tragic as the reality in some ways. So, so it needs a lot of work. Uh, it's probably never going to live up to the hopes and expectations of its founders. Uh, but it still does some good and useful things, if only highlighting some of the problems in the world. Some of the peacekeeping activities work pretty well. Some of the health activities and promotion things work pretty well. So it does do good work. Uh, it's not always headline grabbing. It may not be able to solve the problems between the United States and China. But if it can solve any problems at all, and it doesn't cost that much, then it's worth having, it seems to me, in the same way that the European Union is. Because I think the European Union costs, what, 0.5% of Britain's GDP or something ludicrous, and yet they're working themselves into lather about getting out of it. So, anyway, I won't launch into a diatribe about that, but yes. <laughs> Um, I kind of have two questions, hope that's okay. Um, first is, I'm an economic student, um, so I was just wondering if you know any about um, uh, optimal currency areas and um, with respect to the EU and just because uh, my impression um, is that uh, like a massive kind of, uh, um, I guess what was the word, um, super governmental kind of organi uh, country organizations like the EU are going to be quite prone to currency crisis of the, of the kind that's mm. um, happened with Greece and so on. And it's kind of inevitable in the same way that I guess you could kind of say that uh, capitalism is kind of prone to a massive uh, recession every so often. Um, secondly, you've been... Can I answer that one? Because I'll forget otherwise. So, uh, so I, do, I do know a bit about optimal currency areas, but I won't bore everybody stiff with it because it's not you know, a, a riveting topic for everybody. But I think the, the, the important thing about the optimal currency area in the 
European Union, the Euro, is that it highlighted uh, a real paradox. Uh, the people who were pushing this were mainly politicians. And there were a lot of German economists who said, oh, it's going to end in tears, it's not a good idea, it can't work when you've got countries that are so different trying to be part of the same uh, currency uh, regime. And as it turned out, they were right. There were huge problems with Greece and many other countries. The problem was, and the, 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 the tragedy of this, to uh, quote my learned colleague, the tragedy of this is that it seemed like a good idea. And I was in favor of it, for what it's worth. I don't claim to be an expert on this, but I thought it was a good idea simply because it kept the momentum going of greater, deeper integration in Europe. And anything that promoted that seemed to me was a good idea. Now, I think it was a question of politics getting ahead of economic fundamentals and not taking those uh, constraints uh, as seriously as they would. But it's kind of understandable, in a way, uh, given that... You know, there's a bicycle theory of Europe. You know, if it doesn't keep going forwards, it falls over. And that was part of the kind of thinking, I think, of some of the people who were championing these greater and greater forms of uh, cooperation, integration. And, you know, federal Europe, I think, is still a good idea in principle. It's going to be really difficult to do, and there are lots of obstacles, and it probably won't happen. But the alternative is what? I mean, we know what Europe looks like without cooperation, with ill will, with uh, uh, a lack of trust amongst the European countries. I mean, it's a blood-soaked uh, history uh, like no other. So I don't think we want to go back to that.